Kia ora everyone um, and welcome to this policy and strategy uh, panel discussion um, as part of the uh, REC Asia Australia Unconference. Uh, called Georgina Ray Tokalingua. My name is Georgina Ray. Um, it happens to be Te Reo o Wiki, Te Reo Māori o Wiki, which is Māori Language Week in New Zealand. So doing my best to apply um, one of our national languages here. Uh, and it's a, um, a really fun and exciting sort of journey that we're all going on locally to um, build our, our shared knowledge of Te Reo Māori um, and share it with the world. So uh, I am I'm really privileged to be part of this um, panel discussion as, as the facilitator today. Um, so thank you for that opportunity. Um, I'm the Science Engagement Manager at the New Zealand eScience Infrastructure. Um, we, we refer to ourselves as NESI. Um, and in that role, I um, get to I, I get the privilege of thinking about things like um, the REC community, um, working with uh, colleagues you'll be far more familiar with people like Nuria, um, who do um, all the hard work here. So um, that that's how I fit in. Now, um, I'd like to, um, to note that the organizers of this first REC Asia Australia Unconference would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land upon which they stand, the Yagara people and the Turrbal people. Wurundji sorry, Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and the Muwini Na people. They wish to pay respects to elders past, present and emerging leaders. They also acknowledge the contemporary Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities who continue to maintain their identity, culture and Indigenous rights. Okay, now before we get into the discussion itself and um, you get to meet or, or learn and hear from all the fabulous people pinned to the screen with me, um, I wanted to point out that this unconference does have a code of conduct. Um, so uh, please uh, head to the conference you know, website and check that out if you're not familiar with it. Um, helps it be an inclusive and um, a good event for everyone involved. So I do highly recommend that. Now, policy and strategy. We have a fabulous lineup of a variety of different people with different experiences and perspectives, I think, although we might see some common themes emerging as well, who knows? Um, so first off, I was going to invite each of the panelists to introduce yourselves. Um, I'm going to suggest that we do this by way of the order in which you appear on my screen. So um, that's, a, you know, uh, we'll go with that. So Saranjit, we'd love to hear from you. Um, can you introduce yourself a little bit about what you do, why you think you're here um, for the audience? Thank you. Thank you, Georgina. Hello, everyone. My name is Saranjit Kaur. Uh, I'm a statistician based in India. Uh, and uh, I am also the co-founder of the RAC Asia Association, which uh, I started uh, during one of my, during my projects uh, with Open Life Science Cohort 4 last year. So it is uh, almost one year for RAC Asia this month, and uh, we have been doing quite some uh, outreach and community work at RAC Asia. Uh, besides besides my work, I also uh, do some open source projects, uh, like I'm a technical writer with Google Season of Docs for the R Development Guide. Um, previously, I was involved with uh, the Code for Science and Society at the Digital Infrastructure Incubator, where I was helping to build the R community. Uh, I have also done Google Summer of Code with the Julia Language Organization. And uh, more recently, I was a uh, subject matter expert with uh, the NASA Transform to Open Science program, where I was uh, I contributed in the Open Science Tools and Resources team. Uh, so that is where basically I am, and uh, also building the RAC Asia Association. Uh, and uh, this is the first time 
that I am collaborating with uh, the RSC Australia New Zealand uh, Association, and this is our first uh, unconference with them. So I'm looking forward to hearing to the other panelists. Thank you, and I'm honored to be invited on this panel. Thank you, Saranjit. And I must say, um, my first impression of the, the group Asia REC is, gosh, that sounds huge and ambitious. So I'm very excited <laughs> to hear about all the plans and, and strategies and policies from you through the next hour or so. Uh, next up on the screen is Andy. So I'll hand over to you now, Andy. Let's um, hear about okay. why you're here. Okay, thank you. Uh, I can tell you a bit about why I'm here. So I uh, originally came from a physics background and sort of fell into coding because I was interested in modeling the circulation in the ocean. And so I guess some time ago, I used to do lots of coding and um, writing models for the for the ocean circulation and trying to release them and, and so on. It was in the days before there was even such a thing as a research software engineer. So, um, uh, and, Around about uh, 15 years ago, I came back from overseas to Australia and, and started working at ANU doing um, ocean modelling and climate modelling here. Um, and one of the things I've been pushing over the last few years at least is um, basically setting up infrastructure to help our ocean models be used more widely by a wider group. Um, and so that was no longer doing the coding myself, but I put together a group that we called COSIMA. COSIMA stands for Consortium of Ocean Sea Ice Modelling in Australia. And if you look at the thing behind me, that's an image from a from an ocean sea ice model. And this this stuff around Antarctica there is sea ice, and the rest of it is looking at a snapshot of salinity at the ocean surface in one of these models. So you can see pretty high resolution and, and a fair bit of detail there. Um, so uh, I guess you know our main aim with COSIMA was to kind of expand the community and basically support the research through infrastructure that was software. And then a few years ago, the government funded an initiative that we, we know as Access NRI. And Access NRI, Access is Australia's climate model and weather model and a system model. And Access NRI is essentially funded through um, research infrastructure money out of the Australian government. And it uh, our mandate here is to um, is to provide the infrastructure behind uh, climate and weather modelling in Australia. So we're a pretty new organisation. I, I was appointed uh, here in March. Um, at the time, there were only a couple of other employees. We're now sort of about half full, but we're still we're still expanding. Um, most of the people we will employ here are, are research software engineers, and so um, it's yeah, it's nice to be invited along to this event and and to hear what all of you have to say. Awesome, thanks, Andy. And I think establishing a, a group um, in, in what's probably a space that not everyone understands might be a um, experience that lots of people on this call have have worked through or are about to. So um, good to hear that one. Now, Manadeep, um, introduce yourself, please. Thank you. Um, Hi everyone. So my name is Monadeep Sinha. I am an astronomer, a computational astronomer by profession. And that's a supercomputer with me in front with binary black holes <laughs> that they meet gravitational waves. Uh, basically, <clears throat> so I I study galaxies generally. Like galaxies are what we see, and I write lots of code and run lots of simulations to figure out how we map. So that's sort of the what of um, what I do. But there are two other aspects of what I do, which is how we do. So for me, the things that are important is um, how we carry out our research. So for example, being end goal for me is always reproducibility and open and reproducible. So for me, these are the policies, or these are the things I always try to prioritize in in my circles of influence, making it open, making it publicly available, making it um, reproducible and so on. Um, the last one is who does it and who gets the credit? And that's sort of why I am here. So back in 2017, um, I co-founded the RSA AUNZ, the Research Software Engineers. This wasn't a 
thing that existed. Um, and it's like, oh, okay, we really need to do this. And so, and so, so from that, that point on, I've been involved in getting, raising awareness about this RSC term, like, look, this is a critical part of our research infrastructure. These people have the skills and, and, and also trying to be inclusive, right? Because we know this field is very male dominated. So like who gets to do the re work, who gets to be involved, who gets the credit? These are aspects I care about. Um, and hence, these are things that bring me on board for a panel like this. And thanks, thanks actually for inviting me. Awesome. Yes, and we have um, seen your your name associated with this work for a long time. So, thank you, and um, look forward to hearing from you today. Now, last but definitely not least is Asif. So, um, I think coming all the way from Malaysia, although I'm not sure if you're physically there at the moment. But um, uh, please introduce yourself. Hi. Thank you, Georgina. Um, I. Since you mentioned about slides, I just managed to find a few slides that I could show. Is that okay? Absolutely. Well, that, that all depends on if this all works, but give it a crack. Okay. <laughs> so, can you see that? Uh, can you see it? Yes. Yeah? Swap the display. Okay. I think that works. Yeah. Okay. So I want to say, uh, well, you can call me Asif. Um, uh, I feel like I'm the outlier of the group here. Uh, I, I just discovered that I may be an RSE wanderer or a lost soul. Uh, until recently when uh, Roland Mosbergen, I think I, I'm, I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly and he's, he's listening. Uh, invited me to be part of this panel. Uh, I didn't even know of the term RSE. So I quickly did some homework <laughs> before this panel. And I realized that I've been actually doing something like this for the past many, many years. I just didn't recognize the label RSE. And so I'm really happy that I've been finally, uh, well, enlightened uh, and, and made aware of this. So very quickly, um, about myself, uh, sorry, uh, professional <laughs> journey. Um, uh, well, I was actually born in India, but so that's not, uh, and then, okay, this is, I edit the last minute. Well, professionally, um, I was, uh, I grew up in Brunei and then I moved to Singapore. I did my bachelor's, my master's, my PhD, everything there. So 11 years in Singapore. And that's when I started doing bioinformatics um, um, at the bachelor's level, master's and PhD level. Although my bachelor's was biotech, but towards the end, I got introduced to bioinformatics, the wonderful world of informatics. And, um, and then I moved to the US Johns Hopkins. I was there for about a year and I continued pursuing that area of research and Hopkins sent me to Malaysia. Uh, there was a collaboration with Pradana University, a brand new university under the uh, you know, mandate of the government. Uh, to set up something pioneering, something top-notch. Uh, so we moved over there uh, to help set up Pradana University. I was there for eight years. And then recently I got seconded to Turkey uh, where I'm still doing the same thing, trying to promote and grow data science bioinformatics. Uh, so as, as the name implies, data science bioinformatics, there's a lot of informatics, there's a lot of computational work there. So of course uh, we need, um, we, we do work with uh, RSCs. Uh, this is just very quickly some of my role. We, uh, I was former Dean of School of Data Sciences. So again, uh, there's, there's a lot of relevance, Director for Center for Bioinformatics, Chief Data Officer, so, uh, and Startup. Uh, EpiBionet is Asia Pacific Bioinformatics Network. Um, again, something um, I've been doing for many years. I'm the president at the moment, but I'm, I feel so embarrassed that I was not even aware of the, the term RSC. So I'm also part of the, one of the executive um, for director members of Goblet, Global Organization for Bioinformatics, Learning, Education and Training. And I'm gonna do my bit to introduce them to this world of RSE. MBIS is the Association of Medical and Bioinformatics in Singapore. And my bioinfonet is Malaysian Bioinformatics Network. Uh, so uh, everything that I've done, the roles I've done that helped, uh, have very much relevance to this. Again, just embarrassed. <laughs> as you don't know. Uh, personally, in terms of research, uh, this is what I do. Um, genetic, computational immunology, vaccinology, virology, 
uh, very uh, much applied, but I do use uh, a lot of data warehousing techniques, informatics. We develop tools, uh, algorithms, etc. Uh, so we do. I, I do work a lot with uh, these uh, software engineers, and I uh, and, and I have a lot to share in terms of the problems, the challenges, and all that. So I look forward to the rest of the discussion. That's all about me. Thank you. Thanks, Asif. And I would say, um, please don't be embarrassed. This is <laughs> it's um it's fabulous to have your views here because I think that new perspective um will will be interesting balance to some of the uh people that have been around the traps a little longer, <laughs> not looking at anyone. Uh and um yeah, some of could well drive what sort of strategy and policy we might need, I guess. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to um, crack straight into the questions. So we have um, got a, a few prepared, um, but I will um, emphasize that the way this session is structured is where we've got a few um, questions to cover off as a panel discussion, but then, um, well, depending on time, from half past onwards, I'll say half past because it could be half past anything, depending on where you're signing in from. It will be half past four for me in the afternoon. Um, we will move into a um, Q&A um, with, the, with the audience. So um, please um, store up those questions, um, drop, uh, drop them in the chat even, although they might get lost, so store them on a bit of paper as well. Um, and um, definitely we want to see that conversation, kōrero in New Zealand, kōrero conversation happening in the in the chat around some of this stuff as well. So uh, where are my questions? There they are, very good. The first question we have is, what do you think has improved in recognition of the work of RECs in the last few years? Um, and so I was going to start this one perhaps with Saranjit, but we'll give everyone an opportunity. Uh, uh, for Asia, I have started, I've just started it last year, so I don't have much um, to share from Asia, but in general, I can say that uh, RSC as a movement has progressed a lot. Uh, in the UK, it has, I would say, it is now a very established um, uh, role and community, and uh, it's thriving over there. And as other parts of the world pick up on the uh, on the roles and the community, I think it is it is progressing uh, in different parts of the world. So Australia has been doing it since past four to five years. Asia has just started. So these are some of the major hubs where uh, RSE is emerging as a community and as well as a pro profession. So uh, that's that's my take on it. Fabulous. And does anyone want to jump in next before I volunteer you? Fabulous. Oh, you Manna deep, go for yeah, it. <laughs> I will. Yeah, the, it's to me the biggest thing that has increased is the awareness. Just, just the fact that there is this term called research software engineer. The fact that it's not a completely opaque and obscure thing as much anymore. Like when I see jobs in, again, my context is Australia, but I see jobs that are advertised with research software engineer in the title, like this is your position. That to me is a win, like, hey, look, you know what category you're, you're looking for, right? And as, as humans, we are, we are sort of, tend to be in, in, think of ourselves in groups. And so the fact that research software engineers are and getting more um, uh, formal in terms of jobs is, is, a, is a big win. Um, there's, but there's a wide variety of global movements that are happening, which are helping. Um, like what Saranjit was talking about, NASA tops, for example, the transform to open science. It's not really an RSE thing, but RSEs will be fundamental in making open science happen. Right? So there's a variety like OECD recommendations that came out earlier for Australia. Um, so lots of things are happening worldwide that's raising the awareness for this RSE role. 
Yeah. Andy, do you want to jump in? Sure. So I, I agree that raising the awareness is is important and I agree that that's happening as well. And I think, you know, five years ago, it was fairly uncommon to hear people are called research software engineers and, and, and it is becoming more prevalent. But the other thing which I think has changed, at least in Australia, in the last few years and, and not so much, uh, well, I don't know so much about Asia or New Zealand, but is that... Um, you know, the way things work in Australia is there is separate money for research infrastructure, right? And there's becoming a, a broader recognition that actually research infrastructure is not just hardware. It's not just telescopes and, and computers and things like that, but actually software is infrastructure too. And I think that's really important because when people think of infrastructure, infrastructure, say, to support research, then they care about it. But, but I think... Many people may think that software is this sort of ephemeral thing that can appear and disappear at will, but it's not. It needs real um, long-term care, just as physical infrastructure does. Um, and so I think that that is a big step which has occurred in the last few years and, and certainly will help us uh, in the future. Yeah, that's a really interesting perspective and one that um, just... Um, sneaking in my own perspective here in the New Zealand context uh, there's a sort of government review of of our research sector at the moment um, if you're familiar with it things it reports like um, Te Arapairangi or the um, Te Pai Kahurangi was the foundational sort of scene setting report and um, through the consultation process that theme Andy sang through loud and clear um, they, they had a whole section on infrastructure, you know, how should it be funded, how should, you know, all those standard sort of things. And when you went to the consultation sessions, people were going, yeah, 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 but what about the people? <laughs> we don't, you know, the infrastructure is nothing without the people. And it was a fabulous theme that came through so clearly. Um, and as you st we're starting to hear our policy people from MB, Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment, sort of rehearsing that back to us. So... <laughs> really valuable. Now, Asif, um, new to it all, yeah. but still, yes. um, I, I guess you can also frame this in terms of what this has meant for you in, in just the last year or so, but, you know, how does this improve, <laughs> how, how have things changed for you in the RSC space? Right. <laughs> so, um, uh, I agree with uh, uh, Manodeep about the awareness, and I'm going to touch upon that, but before that, I just want to state that um, I cannot overemphasize the importance of RSEs. I mean, these people uh, who do this work are really, really important. And uh, the last two years being based in Turkey, having difficulty finding these people uh, really further highlights the important work uh, that these people are doing and, and the demand that's there uh, for such individuals. It's just tremendous. And um, yeah, I'm struggling. Uh, to, to find uh, people, especially in academia, because the industry grabs them and takes them. Um, so, but um, so, so just wanted to declare that importance, and I think all of you know that. But uh, people from my area maybe do not uh, still recognize that. Um, and so that brings me to the next point: that RSE recognition, or you know, these individuals in academia, it's it's still a mess. I don't think we have a proper structure of how to, uh, I mean, though I've been doing bioinformatics and we should be a bit more well-versed uh, with how to handle this. Of course, there are places where I think this is better, but in many parts of Asia, I mean, Malaysia, um, even in Turkey, at least, um, and maybe to some extent Singapore too, I, I think um, uh, a proper structure for career, for actually uh, how to engage with RSEs, how to take advantage, maximize, uh, maximize them, uh, I, I think that's still lacking. I think the industry has got this somewhat figured out, but in academia, uh, it's, I, I personally feel still a mess. Um, and then um, coming to back to Manudeep's point about um, the awareness, uh, now that I am aware about RSEs, I think the awareness within the RSE circle of people who do this software engineering um, research, uh, they themselves are more aware of this. But I think the problem is people who work with these, uh, who, are, who work with RSEs, these people are not really that aware of this world. I mean, even the label RSE, it's not something that they're aware of. 
Um, and I, I can see this uh, from my line of work and the people I work with. Um, again, this was like news to me. So imagine those who don't really um, uh, do much of bioinformatics or data science, um, at least in academia. So I, I think that awareness uh, is still lacking and much more needs to be done. I'm really happy to see that the RSC community has really come together and established itself and are forming chapters or what nodes are across the world. Uh, I, I think maybe the next step would be really to reach out and connect with um, the life scientists, the biologists, um, um, uh, the researchers really the researcher community who work with them but don't really understand or don't really uh, you know make um, are not really full aware of the challenges that the RSCs feel um, so that's uh, that's I think uh, the crux of the problem uh, and and maybe uh, a lot more and I, I implore plead the RSCs to actually look into that uh, to help us <laughs> uh, uh, you know as researchers uh, to 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 do more for you guys and, and to really work uh, better together. Uh, so, um, and then in terms of recognition, I, I think much has improved coming to the real question here, what has improved? Uh, I think, uh, you know, I remember when I was doing my bachelor's, uh, these uh, software engineers or code, I mean, I, I don't wanna use this, but I've even heard the word term mon um, uh, coding monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to say that, but uh, so uh, by 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 researchers or scientists who just use these guys, uh, and and don't really show that respect the importance. Um, but of course, I think they know the importance of these people, but somehow, um, you know, the the bigger importance or the credit usually goes to people who who think about the problems, the research question, and these people are just the go to people. You go, hey, do this for me, and and can you do this and build this, and that's it. Um, so in terms of recognition, credit. I think much has improved. I give you one example. I mean, you have a research question, a research problem, and usually it's, it might be very biological. So when you publish a paper, you just publish um, that particular aspect of the research question, the hypothesis, and the uh, the software part might be a very small component of that um, paper. But uh, you know, uh, especially in our field, bioinformatics, we we do recognize that the same work could be published uh, from the software perspective. So you could publish a separate paper. Uh, with that, just that software uh, in mind, and 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 the, the person who developed it could be the first author instead of being somewhere in the middle. So you know, trying to salami or look at the different facets of that work and trying to give credit to this, uh, that different facet by publishing it as a separate uh, aspect and and getting those recognition. And there are journals that accept and welcome that kind of submission. NAR, nucleic acid research has a database issues, so, um, web server issues and high impact factor uh, so and and they don't ask you to write big and they accept um, not rather easily but you know there's a big chance of being accepted uh, and there's so many other journals i think gos is also there uh, so uh, in terms of recognition i think there's much improvement and also i, I feel github as a repo for codes uh, has has been a big help uh, and and this has really grown uh, has really helped the biologists who are learning how to code showcase their work and get recognition and get citations so i think this advent of micro citations has, has really helped and and these um, uh, you know your github repositories can can serve as some sort of a micro citation that go into CVs, your CVs, and help you uh, see career advancement, uh, get promotions, etc. So, in terms of recognition, I think there's there's much uh, that has improved. Okay, that's Thanks, no, all for now. Yeah, <laughs> that covered a lot of terrain there, um, and I think there are there's a, a few. Um, different things that we could probably pick up on there, but I I can see there's a bit of a bit of chat going on around um, pub publishing software and um, the, the pros and cons of that. Uh, and I think perhaps this is actually the nice segue into the next question, which is while we can pat ourselves on the back for improvements so far, and I think as if your example of the language we've used in the past for um, these fabulous people towards the language and the labels that we have now, which are positive, constructive and, and meaningful, that's a huge improvement, right? That's something we can all be proud of. Um, so what do we have to do more of then to incentivize recognition? And, and I, I guess that I'm really interested from, you know, 
definitely from the policy and the strategy angle, but, you know, open to tactics and things as well. You know, <laughs> what do we need to change here to, to get that um, really recognised? Um, anyone want to jump in first? Yeah, I, I guess I can jump in. Uh, and it sort of relates to what people are, are putting in the chat at the moment. Um, so, uh, you know, there's the, there's the comment that maybe we need to publish papers along with software and, and in the chat people are saying, well, is publishing really where we want to be? You know, should we, should we have GitHub contributions as our metric? And there is a really wide um, push within universities to have non-traditional metrics recognised. Um, so, for example, people in fine arts want, want that. People who are um, making contributions to policy want you know, not just journal papers as being how they're recognised. And so I, th I think maybe that's something that we can push for is that is to have a system which does recognise people for their contributions to code and the impact that that code has, rather than needing to pay, publish a paper in a journal to, to demonstrate value. Okay, who wants to follow on? I can, like yeah. basically. So it's sort of a person tell. Last last year, I was applying for a promotion, and so I am an author of a very popular astronomy package, like runs really fast, and it's cited quite a few times a year. So I talked to the promotions committee, the promotions manager, appropriate person. I was like, "Hey, look, I have this fantastic piece of software that works for a lot of people worldwide." And how do I put it into my promotion stuff? And the response was basically caused cognitive dissonance for me. The response was that we view software as a regular part of research. Therefore, we don't count it as your research output. Uh, it, it was just mind blowing to me. It's this, wait, so you're saying the thing that's a core part of my research that lets me do my work is not actually acknowledged as my work. Uh, so. For starters, right? This is something we need to acknowledge that, <laughs> come on, this is software. Without research software, our research has no legs, essentially. Most of our research, not all, but just about most of our research requires research software. Uh, and I, I, I think the levers need to come down from higher up at the national policy level before things can change on that. Saranjit, have you got something to add here? Yes, uh, I would like to pick up on what Manudeep was saying. So I had some similar experience where I was I was building a, a code base and developing the methodology there, but somehow um, my senior or the person who was supervising me was not convinced that that is actual research writing code is actual research and uh, for, for them it is more about the theory and unless you do unless you're doing something novel in the theory it it won't be recognized as much so um uh one way that i can uh, uh i personally feel can um uh, affect us making them aware that there are journals and public ways of publication, publishing the software itself uh, and citing the software. And uh, it is it is an important part of my work. Unless I would have written, unless I wrote that software, my, my work would have not progressed actually. Uh, so, and I only started writing the theory after I was able to um, do it on my uh, uh, program or write a code for it. So. Uh, 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 I still don't have a proper answer for that, why there is that kind of bias or why software is seen as a bit lower in the research field and why theory research is considered superior or higher up. Uh, so yeah, one way, one way to uh, convince uh, people who are following the traditional academic pathway is to show that there are, there are authentic journals that publish software uh, as the first output, say the Journal of Open Source Software or many similar journals. There are also 
data papers, uh, as I would like to highlight. So there is a chapter in the Turing Way book, uh, which uh, discusses about publishing different kind of articles. So there's a chapter on micro publishing. There's there are chapters on data papers, software papers, method papers. So that is one way where you can highlight that all these steps of research are important and each has a significant value in the whole research process. Absolutely. And Asif, um, what what would you do or what would you like to see more of to get this um, the incentive, incentives right? Right. Um, so uh, I think a lot of the problem that we, uh, I mean, the RSC community is facing is, uh, well, to some extent is uh, due to ignorance um, of uh, the people at the higher level who have the so-called power uh, to decide uh, the fate, the promotion and of the RSC. So, and, and the only, I think the key solution to overcome that is uh, to have communication, more of more communication, more awareness uh, is really key um, because I think if they're ignorant, they don't understand, they don't see it's, um, and it's our job then to make them aware, make them see how, uh, this is really important. And as Manojeep and others have mentioned, um, you know, it's like the core part of your project. That's the, there's no leg without the software. I mean, how can they not see that and they don't recognize that? What's blocking, what's that mental block for them to not be able to see that without this, there's really no that. Um, and it's just mind boggling, uh, uh, that kind of statement um, that was just shared. So I think communication and awareness key. And uh, how do we do that? Uh, how do we then, uh, get get this out there. So I think uh, there, there are various uh, stakeholders uh, that we need to engage. Uh, so organizations themselves uh, that deal with RSEs, I think they themselves need to recognize this. And I think the onus is on the researchers um, in those organizations to come together. I mean, unless you are just one in that organization, but if you are a few of you in that organization to really come together and and uh, you know, uh, make make the top management recognize. And if you are part of that top management, then the job, I think, becomes much easier. But really to, to make this recognition at the top level of uh, the importance. And one way uh, to do that is not just to tell them, yeah, they're important. Everybody would say, yeah, sure, you guys are important. But but uh, this can translate in the form of, uh, let's say, a career progression trajectory. I think often uh, that's really lacking. Okay, you come in, okay, I give you a title of RSE, and then what? what where do you go from there? What's the next step? I think that itself uh, is still, it, the community itself, I think, still are struggling to, to have that well-defined. Um, so, uh, and, 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 and so some sort of a trajectory so people when they come in they see that there's a next step and the next step so they are progressing so that needs to be done uh, and and having that established by working by the organization working with RSC seeking their help how do we figure this out how do we reward people uh, who do this for us um, that's very important uh, I think secondly in terms of awareness um, you know at the university level the courses the curriculum that's out there I think this needs to be also discussed when these uh, individuals are at the learning stage you know so uh, that's when we change their mindsets uh, and make them aware uh, and, and see make them see the value so curriculums may need to maybe start introducing the uh, word RSC or have, I'm not saying, you know, have one full course, but uh, at least somewhere along that curriculum, this uh, awareness, awareness needs to be made. I don't know myself how that needs to, how that should be done, uh, but I think it's really important at the university level, at the undergrad level, that because that's where most of these guys, software engineers learn, and very few of them may do um, uh, masters or PhD. So I think it's essential that at the undergrad level, uh, this gets um, spelled out. Uh, even the problem, what's an RSE, what, uh, I think that's important. Um, and then I think, um, you know, things like what we have mentioned, promoting your work, whether through publication or through, you know, repositories out there, GitHub and others uh, alike, um, or preprints. Um, so I, I think more of that needs to be done. So, um, it encourages micro citation, it encourages recognition, like how many people are using. And there are also grants, actually. I think Chan Zuckerberg uh, Foundation has also 
have been uh, you know funding a lot of these software projects um, and and they're really looking in terms of uh, the utility of that software how many people are really using as one of the criteria for funding not so much I think about um, you know the publications on all that, but really having a community around your software. So getting it uh, out there in GitHub and then tracking the the, the use use uh, you know, visitor number of visitors and the community that you build around that. I think um, that itself will speak about your work and 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 make the organization recognize, realize the important work that you are doing. Uh, so I think more of that needs to be done and we should not be shy to put our code there, seek help. There are a lot of Slack channels, a lot of uh, places where we can get help and, and be, be part of our own small community where this work is done. Uh, last but not least, um, I think, um, you know, conferences. So at this um, conference, conference is, is a very good example. Um, of uh, you know making people realize their worth, their value, so that they go and demand that, or at least negotiate that uh, with, with the people that really matter. And um, but I think more importantly, uh, this is a good start. This is great start. But uh, I think it would be great if RSC could be uh, a small uh, track uh, in in non RSE conferences. Um, uh, or could be, for example, we have INCOB. Um, I mean, in, we, are, we actually, we have our own flagship conference, international conference on bioinformatics for 21 years. And we never had a, a, a track like that. I think um, having RSEs go into all these other bioinformatics conferences or data science conferences, you know, people who use software engineers and to have a small track or small session, or even just a, key, a talk, uh, an oral presentation uh, to be given so that you reach out to the researchers out there, uh, I think that's going to have huge impact. Um, uh, many of them will be just surprised to learn about the word RSE itself. So I think these are simple uh, yet very effective. Um, some of these are simple, some of them are not simple, uh, but these are some of the things um, at the top of my head that I think uh, we could do um, right away. Yeah. Thank I hope you. everyone was noting those down. That was fabulous. <laughs> um, uh, Saranjit, you've got your, your hand raised. Uh, yes, so uh, I was reflecting on what Asif was saying, and uh, I, I feel uh, in in regions where this uh, term has not got much of awareness, I feel that it, it gets dissolved with the data science world or the data science profession, and uh, RSEs could be seen like this could be very parallel to what a data scientist is, uh, so I have a question for the panel itself. Uh, how how would you emphasize uh, difference between a data science job and a RSC job? So if if I want to share it with someone, how how I can tell them that this is this is something different, or even though if it is parallel, it's quite different from the data science world. So yeah, a any thoughts there? Job title. I mean, we we advertise for research software engineers as the job title. Uh, that's I think that's really important to get that up front. And and when we're advertising for a data scientist, and we actually will soon, we, we'll add will it'll be a job title of a data scientist. So um, and and just specifying. I mean, within the roles, specifying what what they're doing rather than um, you know rather than having a generic kind of uh uh cover all advertisement so i think that's yeah just be specific about what you want i, I suppose i see for manadeep yeah yeah uh manadeep go ahead um, sorry i actually i think the roles have a lot of overlap and part of it is because both roles are somewhat fuzzy and and again at RCAUNZ, we have intentionally defined RSC as more inclusive in terms of how how you enable the research part, either through software or maybe through scaling or hardware and so on. So a data scientist is possibly more closer to the end in terms of getting results out, in terms of insights out. But I think there's a lot of overlap. And if you, in terms of skills as well, frequently these, these require like statistics. It's modern research. We need lots of statistical tools to, to get
get the right one. Well, know that we have a robust result, right? So I, I think it's not a zero sum game, right? Like it's, here's what does the job require? And here's what, you, what your skills are. And then see that what works better for you. Like if you perceive yourself, do you think of yourself as a research software engineer? Uh, like as in more, uh, to me, that's more at the nitty gritty level or can be more at the nitty gritty level. Like this is running on this platform. Whereas a data scientist can be a little more removed from the underlying platform like the real. But again, it depends on, that. that's how I see it. That, I see. Yeah, um, so I, I agree with the other panelists. Um, I, I think uh, uh, the overlap is part of the, well, part of the communication problem. Um, uh, I, I think the definition itself, I was listening to a video earlier, trying to prepare myself. Uh, I think the, I, I, I felt that there's still no formal definition, maybe there is, and I'm not aware, uh, but the definition that was shared uh, through this YouTube talk was that, you know, you have software engineer, you have research, so there's a spectrum, and, and, and some people are at the more software engineer side, some people are more on the research side, some people might be in the middle, and do you still consider yourself to be an RSE? And um, as, as part of this communication, I think a definition uh, would really help if there's one out there already, that's really great. And this definition, also needs to communicate the distinction from data scientist. Actually, there's just so many terms out there. You have uh, software engineer itself. How is that different from RSC? You have computer scientists. How is that different from an RSC data scientist? So um, I, I think uh, that needs to be first sorted out within the RSC community. If it is already, then that's great. Uh, then I think the next, I think that's what Andy was saying uh, when we, when we advertise this, uh, we should really use the right label. Uh, so software engineer, uh, I think it's a great one um, instead of data scientist. Uh, and, but I, I actually, uh, as Andy was talking about that, I just was just thinking, has, do people actually use the word RSC to advertise this? Like research software engineer, software engineer, yes, but what about RSC? Uh, so I think, um, yeah, so maybe to uh, declutter, distinguish, uh, uh, the, the roles is by advertising and getting uh, the terminology that's recognized by RCs to, to be used uh, when we seek out such individuals uh, that, that should help. Uh, but really, I think defining so that the RC themselves are very clear what is the distinction between a data scientist and an RC uh, so that they, uh, they're going to apply that accordingly. That's it. Yeah, awesome. And I'm going to sneak in an answer here as well, Saranjit, because um, over at, in New Zealand at, at Nessie, we um, advertised for and hired a couple of years ago now, a data science engineer. So someone who, uh, and, and the person who took the role has, has um, still has a, a part-time, you know, part of their role, part of the FTE carved out to be a data scientist. Um, but in their role with Nessie, they are... Um, doing the RSC style work with data, data scientists. So just, just to mix it all up or add, add another element of confusion to the mix. Um, yeah, very interesting. Now, I'm just looking at the time. It's 20 past the hour. Um, we have one more of our sort of structured questions um, to go. So I'm definitely gonna put that to the panel. Um, and we have already got some questions through in the chat. Thank you. And thank you, Paula, for capturing those so that they're not lost forever um, in the thread. So I'll move on to that final question and then we will um, we will get open the floor essentially. So um, that final question is, what is the importance of having RSC contributions evaluated for career progression? I might start off with Andy, just mixing it up. Um, yeah, okay. Thanks. Uh, critical, obviously. And um, I, I guess something that I, I wanted to point out, and, and this is actually the same with the last conversation as well, is, the, is that we're not the only community facing this, right? So people who are, you know, working on microscopes in biology labs, they often 
science trained, got a very high level of training, but they're in universities, they're employed as professional staff um, because that's the only category which suits them because they're not writing papers. And so they have no way to progress in their career. So it's it's actually a wider conversation. And, and in this, as, as with the need to use, for example, software as a non-traditional research output, we can combine with other communities to make some progress here. So the rest of the research infrastructure landscape, which is very much focused on physical infrastructure, um, they, they, they have the same problem. And so they are making waves and maybe you'll see something from the NCRIS directors in the next few months um, with a position paper on essentially opening up a third track within the university system, which will uh, promote people based on their technical and competence, technical competence and their abilities, rather than um, uh, either managing people, managing progressively more people, or writing progressively more papers and teaching more classes. So, so I think that's what actually has to happen. And if that happens, then then the pathway becomes clearer. But at the moment, the problem is that with research software engineers, as with many other essential workers in the research landscape, there is no category that's designed for those people and, and no promotion system designed, designed for those people. So that's what needs to happen. And that needs to happen at quite a high level, in my view. But we have allies in that. We're not, we're not the only people trying to do it. And, and that's what we need to use as our lever. Okay, maybe Asif next. Oh, you're muted. Yes, uh, I, I mean, I, I think uh, Andy pretty much covered uh, uh, the scope of this. I, I, as I mentioned earlier, also, I, I think uh, it, it needs to be, it's very important that the RC contributions be evaluated for career progression. Um, and, and it's the people who, you know, who are higher up and really uh, so called the supervisors of these individuals. Uh, have to have uh, you know this aspect as part of that uh, end year evaluation, um, but uh, you know rather than having it simply as you know what well, what did you do, uh, but it needs to be stretched out like um, okay yeah you built the software and and that's about it, but I think it needs to be expanded into uh, looking at the complexity of of that work itself you know. Uh, what goes into making that software, what, uh, how the, the difficulty that they went through, the, the challenges they faced and how did they overcome uh, rather than yes, you built and that's it. Um, so um, I, I think uh, uh, this evaluation going a little deeper, like in, in the form of the format of such an evaluation, um, uh, if there is uh, if there is one uh, if, if there's an organization that has already got that figured out I think uh, that's something that needs to be shared so that others can adopt um, I think there's a saying that the future is already there just not um, uh, equally distributed so I think some people as Andy was saying may you know some places they've already figured out what needs to be done and how how best it needs to be done uh, it just needs to trickle into those places where they do not have those and 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 apply those uh, and implement uh, so that these uh, RACs can really um, progress and, and be feel feel rewarded and, and sense of gratification. Thank you. And Saranjit? Uh, yes, I think we were discussing the career progression for RACs in one of the unconference sessions. Uh, and we did make a list of uh, what kind of uh, recognition can be given so they can make a record of the kind of contributions they're doing and always discuss it with their supervisor or senior manager so that they are able to uh, quantify uh, the uh, progress that they have made throughout the year so we were also discussing of about having re regular annual performance reviews for uh, RACs uh, and um, uh, uh, progress them according to their performance in those uh, reviews. Uh, Georgina, you 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 are on mute. Oh, that's my trick. Just thank you, Serenjeet. Um, yeah, definitely some good um, 
things that we can apply, real things we can apply there. So, Maladeep, um, what are your thoughts here on the importance of having RSC contributions evaluated for those for that career progression? I mean, clearly it has to be, right? You, you, we are in a sort of capitalistic society. If you're not getting some value out of paying someone, why are you keeping them around, right? So uh, clearly that's, if, if as a community, as the research sector, if we value RSEs, we have to value, start off with valuing their contributions. I, I, I actually think that it's a, it needs a broader rethink around what are the traits we value? This is sort of a, like, which specific things about RECs do we value? Do we, uh, and capturing, we, we have, we always will want to write it down as a metric, right? Um, but a lot of what RECs do is a little more fuzzy in terms, at least to, in my experience, it's more collaborative. Here, here's a, like, I have solved someone else's problems with 10 minutes. They've been like, oh, hey, I'm trying to do this. And like, yeah, oh, why didn't you try that software package? How is this ever going to get translated into an RSE contribution? Right? It's just it's just the knowledge bank that exists within the university, and it's sort of a I'm saying university that's my context, but within any research organization, um, and so we need to not value that as as well. Not just here's a research output, here's a software you produced, here's a software you uh, maintained. Here's, how, how that created impact. So it's a, it's a broader effect, but yeah, it has to be. Absolutely. So I think a consistent view there. We've got a theme. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you um, to the panel for uh, indulging us with um, all your experience and um, insights there. Uh, so now we're going to move on to the, the Q&A from the floor. Um, so uh, I'm not going to open up to sort of raising your hand and, and asking a question quite yet because we do already have some captured from the chat and they look quite good. So um, the first one that we have here is from, actually, I'm going to stop. We've been sitting down, well, I have for, for an hour. Does everyone want to um, just take 30 seconds, stand up, turn around and sit down again? Go for it. I haven't been timing that, but I think, you know, that Friday was, afternoon for me. Friday. That was not 30 seconds, Julie. <laughs> oh, I'm a bit tired. It's Friday. Just bear with me. Anyway. Okay. Now we're energized. Um, from Aaron. Uh, and this question um, rang true uh, when Asif said that we need to think about what's happening in the curriculum, what's happening in the undergrad. Um, to to upskill people and to um, build awareness of RSC as a career path and RSC as a skill set. Um, so Aaron asked, has anyone on the panel learned RSC skills during undergrad or was it ad hoc? Um, so what, what sort of skills should we be um, uh, emphasizing during early career development to be a fabulous RSC? So what I thought we might do is First off, anyone, and this is not just the panel, I can see the rest of you over here, um, raise a hand if you learnt these skills or some core part of these skills in your undergraduate training. We've got one, one taker. Two. No one from the panel? That's a two, sorry, I blurred out, but three, yes. Oh. Okay. Okay, well, that, that feels a bit nicer. I thought it was going to be zero, but um, we'll put it to the panel then. Um, what uh, what skills do you think are the, the emphasis? Maybe pick three. You know, what are your, your favorite three? Serenjeet, what were the three top or no more than three? Uh, uh, so I have a graduate degree in statistics, so I'll pick the first skills as statistics. Uh, due to due to the course that I studied, I also learned a bit of programming. So uh, programming in R, Python, and Julia. Uh, and then I was doing a project where I learned GitHub. So these are three main skills that I uh, learned. 
uh, during my studies and some projects just immediately after my study. But RSC is so when I discovered the RSC role, I actually felt that I found my tribe. Uh, so this this is the place to be. <laughs> so yeah, that that's where I am. Awesome. Any any other skill sets um, the panelists learnt during undergrad that um, over and above what Saranjit just um, shared? Or perhaps they were the same. Yeah. I said, well, look, I, okay. I, I can say that I obviously did my undergrad a long time ago, but um, I didn't learn any. I dropped out of any computing topics and I picked up uh, logic instead, formal logic, and it was far more useful to coding than uh, actually doing the computer science. So uh, I'm not sure if that would still apply there. Interesting. Computational thinking. It's what they're teaching the young kids yes. these days, isn't it? Mm. As if. Right. Uh, uh, so I think um, when when you talk about skills, uh, as we talked earlier, uh, the very definition and the overlap with data science. So uh, I think if you take a computer science course, uh, then a lot of those skills are going to be relevant if you do an engineering, uh, even um, if you do uh, bioinformatics, for example, I think they teach you coding, they teach you statistics, they teach you um, uh, well, there's always a research project, so you also get some research experience, the research process, the research methodology, uh, you know, research question, hypotheses, objectives, testing the hypotheses and things like that. So um, I, I think uh, these days I feel, uh, you know, a lot of these undergrad courses do have research component, final year research project, or if they go into honors year, then research is a big part of that. So if they do research, uh, they're gonna be bound to use um, some aspects uh, uh, of RSE um, because informatics is just so prevalent these days. It's omnipresent, it's everywhere. You can't really do much these days without informatics. So, um, but of course, in terms of software uh, engineering aspect, um, um, I, I think analytical skills, problem solving skills and, and the research, um, the research, understanding the research process uh, would be some uh, common ones. And I think logic mentioned by Andy uh, is, uh, well, usually they don't, uh, they're not formally taught, but uh, uh, that would be also something uh, that I think it's generally there. Uh, so yeah, there's, I, th I think it's quite out there in, in yeah. Right. And Melody, would you like to add anything there? Um, yeah, so what Saranjit said, version control statistics are, essential. The things that I think help quite a bit is testing. So continuous integration specifically, I think helps quite a bit. Um, and the other one that helps is some knowledge about the operating system. Like the number of people, I, students usually ECRs that are confused about pads and how to compile, which, which will get picked up and so Python pads and LD library pads and what have you. Um, and it's all a mystery usually, but that sort of helps um, quite a bit in understanding how a program works, how a computer does what it does. Excellent. Okay. I just um, want to add on uh, just a little. Um, uh -huh. I think uh, if uh, there's always this conversation, you know, should you take a master's degree by coursework or by research, uh, even if the title is the same, uh, I personally feel that uh, doing, uh, doing, taking a research one is where you actually really learn, um, you know, the 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 art of uh, uh, utilizing those skills to problem solving, and that's when you actually learn more about uh, a particular skill rather than just going to a course and you know having go, go through some standard examples. Of course, you still need those, um, but really applying it to solving problems, I think that's where. Uh, these skills get ingrained in us and stay with us. Um, I think um, so. Do as much as long as people do research. I think many of these skills um, uh, would be will, will come to the fore and get utilized. Excellent, and that makes me think. I was in a um, listening into a panel discussion hosted by ARDC earlier in the week around building the skills gap, and one of the panelists said very explicitly there's upskilling and then there's building competency 
um, and just upskilling is not enough. <laughs> so exactly what you're saying there, you know, being able to apply things is really valuable. Thank you. Now, um, I'm going to move to the next, or one of the next questions. I'm shuffling the order around a little bit, um, such is my privilege. So we've heard a lot about the sort of gap in um, awareness. Um, so how do we, how do we, make sure that people, um, particularly powerful people, <laughs> influential people, um, know about RACs and, and um, that can how that can help us, so decision makers and, and whatnot. Um, and Nuria has asked the question, how can we involve more influential RAC advocates to reach decision makers? And this is sort of, you know, getting into that, well, what can we do about this? So love to hear people's ideas from the from the panel. Anyone want to go first here? Anyone done some of this recently? I can't say uh, I have done this, but I, I just feel like um, in terms of advocating, maybe maybe we need to focus on on what RSEs enable rather than rather than the people themselves. And so again, that would be coming back to the to the software as infrastructure. And of course, if you're going to have software being infrastructure, then it needs skilled people to to operate and maintain it. Um, but but that seems to me to be an important an important point to make amongst the decision makers, um, because there's no point just advocating for a, a, a career or, or a cohort of people if you can't connect them to the to the outputs or the impact they have. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So you build awareness on this, this thing that is meaningless to the audience, <laughs> connect it to what they know. Anyone else want to add to that one? I think as if you had um, to give up, didn't you? Yeah. yeah. So I think I touched a little about this earlier. So just want to add on. Um, well, one one way might be uh, you know reaching people at the top. Um, uh, for the RSC uh, community, actually, to become part of these other organizations, um, you know, where the, you have these influential people who have the power to 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 shape things and change things. So I don't think it stops RACs to be uh, to be part of such organization. Just to give you an example, I mean, we at APBionet, Asia Pacific Bioinformatics Network, uh, we would welcome uh, for um, any of the RSC individuals to become a member and be one of the executive board members. Um, uh, I don't think we have a criteria that would prevent them. So they are more than welcome to run for election. In fact, we have election this year. So if anyone, one of you would like to nominate yourself, um, you know, I can nominate you if you're interested. Um, uh, so we'd be happy to have these individuals become part of our organization and help us uh, recognize, realize, and shape the direction of our field um, through your lens, through your perspective, uh, and, and bring some of the values that you would like to see happen. Uh, and, and we have, you know, we work with Asia bioinformatics, bioinformaticians in Asia Pacific. So we, we are in a position to bring about this change. And if you could educate us, make us aware and, and see uh, what you are really about, then we can help uh, push that forward. And I think uh, that becomes a very effective top-down approach. Uh, of course, you also need the grassroots approach, which is what you are doing. Um, but uh, I think it's usually, of course, both are needed, but you see much more, uh, you know, uh, this ripple effect if you have from top-down, uh, because the people with power are really up there. Um, so, I mean, for example, uh, we have ISCB, which is the global one, we have Goblet, so many of these, uh, you guys easily, one of one of few of you could be part of that. In fact, we always, uh, there's a saying, there are not enough people at the top there. So it's very lonely and we would welcome uh, you guys to come and join us and help, uh, you know, chart this direction that would make the RSCs uh, happy and really get, give, get them what they want. Um, uh, so there are people who are willing to help. Uh, there are people who may be not uh, more reluctant, but I think it's largely because of aware lack of awareness. So the more awareness, more communication, 
And that would happen with you guys being part of the club uh, rather than from the outside advocating, but from the inside, um, I think it's going to be more effective. Um, so anybody wants to be signing up for AP Violet Executive Board member, you can put your name there and I'll tell you what to do next. Thank you. There's a career opportunity for someone. Uh, Manadip, did you want to um, respond to that one as well? I don't quite really, but the thing I have found um, is a challenge is sort of people seem to understand established, established academics tend to understand data and then trying to say, no, no, this is different. This is software. Data, yes, data is obviously very important. Data is um, critical, but without software, it's not, you're not gonna get anything out of your data, just pointless. And it's just, so the concept of research software being important and critical needs to percolate a little bit, I think before we, we and we, we're seeing that, we're starting to see that, but like the NRI um, roadmaps that come about. Uh, things tend to get typecast towards data. It's just no, it's not data. It's more important. It's so interesting. We are, um, I've been working a little bit around some, I guess, it's sort of policy stuff in in New Zealand in the infrastructure investment sort of space at the moment. And um, we got a draft report through, um, and it was all about data. It was fabulous, you know, data, 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 data. And software wasn't mentioned at all. Um, and so we took the time to, to put together a, a, a response, a, a paper for the authors um, as some feedback, which was, right, if you have data, it needs to be analyzed. If you want to analyze it, you need software. Like, which is, if, if you're not from that background, that isn't necessarily obvious. So you know, talking to the people at, at their level of understanding. And we managed to change the, it, the report so that it went from no mention of software to 19 mentions of software. So we're looking forward to that one coming out. But, you know, suddenly um, they, they just had no idea. Um, and we had an opportunity through a, a you know, um, we had a little gap clink in the armour, um, an opportunity to weasel in and it, it was successful. So I sort of think... Um, not everyone is going to have those opportunities, of course, but if they come up, um, it's it's kind of our job. Our <laughs> we've got to take that burden on and and put the effort in to educate and and build that awareness. Yes. Now, um, next question. This one's from Tom, and I was wondering about saving it to the end, but we're nearly there. This might be the end. Who knows? It depends on your responses, but. Um, and I'd like to say thank you to the barista in the house. I just got a delivery. I'm very <laughs> distracted, but yes, thank you. Um, so Tom has asked you each to paint a picture. Given a magic wand and the passage of time, how would you describe the ideal life of an REC in 10 years time? I think it's a fabulous question. And I don't know if we can all answer it because that's that challenge, right? Like, what does career progression actually look like? But um, I will pass the magic wand to each of you. So um, is anyone looking particularly fearless right now on the panel? And I'll pass the wand to you first. Otherwise, I'll work my way around the screen. Manadeep, you've got a fabulous smile on, which means you must be ready for the, the answer. <laughs> so the magic wand gets passed to you first. Sure. Uh uh, can I do the <laughs> Brazilian <dinner>? No. <laughs> um, I, I the think the, the first thing that I, I think is that I don't think of an RSC as an individual functioning. I think of RSC groups because that allows for have, because RSCs to me should have, should, should have, um, broad range of expertise. So the way I think of it is sort of a centralized team of RSEs and that sort of differentiates on seniority and experience and so on um, that have long-term contracts. 
and that are valued within whatever system that they are on, that um, have the flexibility, should it suit them, to switch between their RSC type track, let's pretend this exists, to an academic managerial type track or a HU type track as so, so they can move in and out and possibly go out to the industry, right? Like one of the things that we sort of hit upon here is you RC roles are much more valued in industry rather than academia, everything included, including the paychecks, right? Like it's just, it's not comparable. Someone would want to stay in academia, academic research because of some something else that's that's possibly usually is the research component of it, right? So yeah, like I, I would like to see teams at research organizations that 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 collaborate with the departments that um, that enable open and reproducible research, right? Again, values that we want. Uh, so that yeah, that's how I see it. Fabulous. Now, Saranjeet, I'll pass the magic wand to you now. What's um the the gold standard RSC life in 10 years, apart from the Maserati? and the regular trips to Fiji? <laughs> uh, yes, so what I think would be to build the capacity where uh, the RSCs or the RSC professionals uh, can get absorbed into teams from one team to another. So th there is a cross team collaboration. So say there is one team in Asia and one in Australia, and there is a cross collaboration between the RSCs so that they can transfer the skills from one area to other and also learn from there and be back. So that kind of, uh, when when that kind of smooth movement is uh, possible, I would be, I would feel that is a golden time for the RSC profession um, so that they can bring back more skills and also transfer what they have learned on their own team. Uh, and uh, it it is more of, instead of being just concentrated in one part of the globe, this becomes a more global uh, community and a global movement, uh, which involves uh, people from all parts of the of the globe. Excellent. Asif, the magic wand is yours. <laughs> oh, I wish that really does happen. Um, okay. So, um, okay, so my uh, so-called magic wand, what I would, would I wish for, would like to see in 10 years would be that um, coming from academia, that academia to catch up with industry in terms of so-called RSE utopia, all right? So that utopia uh, that we imagine for RSE and what would that utopia look like? Um, uh, at least in my world, they would be, RSEs would be easy to find. Uh, so, you know, because as I mentioned, I've been struggling to get them, um, industry grabs them. So hopefully many of them would like to also stay in academia and contribute because they are well rewarded. Um, so that's one, easy to find. Uh, and I would also like by then that the roles become clearly defined. Uh, this idea of the definition and all that gets sorted out. Um, and uh, third uh, would be career pro progression trajectory be well defined. So we have clear matrices, metrics uh, for evaluation, career trajectory, um, you know, all the way to, to higher levels. Um, so that be well defined and also have uh, various avenues for recognition, uh, publication, software, and who knows some other ways um, that are not yet thought of. Um, for uh, recognition, even the smallest aspect. Um, uh, what comes to mind is what Manudeep was saying earlier. You know, he comes and solves a problem in 10 minutes. Uh, somebody has been struggling for maybe months or weeks. How do you capture that kind of recognition? So um, maybe people will come up with some ways to even have those kind of recognition recognized. And and really, lastly, uh, to for the for the for the community, you know, to to be one and come together to solve complex, grand research problems collaboratively as a team science. Uh, that's that's my vision of the RSC utopia. You're setting the bar high. That's for sure. <laughs> 
Sounds like a great place to be. Um, and I guess, Andy, it's no surprise, the magic wand goes to you next. I, I thought there were only three wishes and we've had our three wishes. So does, it, does that mean I'm off the hook? Um, uh, so actually, I, I, I had a slightly different take on this. I wonder if a lot of what you're talking about can be encapsulated with um, research software engineers having the having positions which gave them their own autonomy. So some level of autonomy to decide, you know, where their contribution would be most valuable um, uh, and, and be able to guide their own um, development. And to some extent, um, something I, I don't like about the notion that RSEs are just supporting rather than pushing the envelope is that then they need, if they're supporting, they need a line manager who tells them what to do. And, and I'm, I'm, I feel like we would all be more productive if we had some level of autonomy. So that's probably so, truly pie in the sky, but there you go. You gotta, you gotta have dreams, Andy. Um, I would add my one in that um, in order once once all of these things are in place as well um, for for the fabulous RSCs out there um, that their outputs their software is um, well funded and has long term funding as well so not just them but their their software that'll take the stress off too. Now I don't think there are any questions extra questions from the floor. That have come in through the chat um, and we're, we've got six minutes left so I'm going to move to our wrap up which is the final final little opportunity for each of you as panelists to give us some advice on what we as a community um, we as RSEs or advocates of RSEs should be doing next to reach these goals so I'm going to, I'll give you a warning this time. Kind, just kindness on the last time. So I'm going to go Serenjeet, Andy, Manadeep, and Asif, because that's the order on the screen for me. Um, so Serenjeet, what what do you think we should be doing next to towards uh, these goals? So uh, first of all, I'm really happy that RSC Asia, uh, sorry, RSC Australia, New Zealand reached out to RSC Asia when we are so young and gave us this chance to collaborate with them uh, and organize this unconference. Just being a part of this process has taught me a lot and uh, also made so many new connections for me, which I can obviously take back to my community and uh, promote it more there. So uh, at RSC Asia, we look for such opportunities to collaborate and also look uh, for support. So if, if you, you are able to promote the work that we do at RSC Asia, because we are completely volunteer run association, that would be a big help uh, for us uh, as we develop uh, in our initial uh, days uh, and uh, progress further. When we have that kind of support and community involvement, I think we would be able to convince uh, the policymakers back in Asia uh, to uh, consider this as a more uh, formal role uh, and uh, also uh, uh, improve the strategy that is uh, present in the Asian context. So, yeah. Fab. Andy, what do we need to do next for you? Uh, I guess I just want to emphasize we should we should find allies. We should build links with different different parts of the research sector that are in the same situation, e even if they're not research software engineers, but they have similar problems with the system. And, and if it's just one community trying to change the system, it's probably not going to work. But uh, if we can find colleagues across the spectrum of, of research who have similar needs, I think that will help. Okay, Manadeep. I, I agree with the things that I've said. The th but one thing I would like to add is that as an RSC, you might really feel undervalued, especially with senior management in your organization. 
it's it's all right your skills are actually valued in the real world and change is coming eventually it will be here right so don't panic <laughs> eventually we will get there awesome and asif right thanks um my biggest uh, take home from this meeting is the discovery of rse so i uh, i am just thinking how many more they are out there waiting to discover rse so please reach out reach out to all of them out there i think they are uh, looking well i i am not disappointed with what i've discovered and i think there are many more like me out there who will be very pleased um to learn about this movement and to really help um, you know take it to the next level and we are ready to do that so um, communicate uh, aware you know, reach out uh, as much as you can thank you awesome so um that's it we have um solved the problems of uh, policy <laughs> and strategy for rscs in australia asia and and possibly beyond um we're going to do it through collaboration um supporting others asking for help working together we're going to be aware that our problems aren't just ours um and that maybe we can leverage that find allies and work with others to to um help solve our problems um we are going to maintain hope um we will get there and we're going to keep talking about this because the more people that understand the problem and um, know that they're one of us, um, the better and, and the closer we're going to get to solving this problem. So um, a big virtual round of applause. I don't know. Can we do that in, in Zoom? Maybe some reactions. Pop, spot, pop some reactions in, folks. Thank you so much to the panellists. Um, really have enjoyed this um, conversation. I look forward to actually meeting some of you in person one day. Uh, and um, otherwise, I'll see you online sometimes, sometime. Um, and so so that's, that's the panel over. Um, you now have a break in